Thank you for having me today. It's really great to be here, and it is um, just really important to learn and to hear from all of you in real life experiences. It really means a lot. Um, at Satellite, I um, run the marketing um, and corporate communications department, but a large part of that work also um, addresses touching on the community. We're a um, not-for-profit dialysis provider. We're headquartered in San Jose, and we serve about um, 8,000 patients in, um, in six states. And we are um, our closest centers um, here. There's actually one just right down the street. Um, on, um, on Telegraph, we have a, um, it's an in-center program. We have a home program in, um, in Emeryville. Lots of centers in the East Bay and um, throughout Northern California. So um, please visit our website, satellitehealth.com, and you can learn more about our, um, our locations and how we work. But I wanna tell you a little bit about um, why it's so important for us to be here today. Um, advocating for our patients and making sure that patients have the best access to information, to resources, um, and to contacts within the kidney community is most important to us as an organization. And to be able to sponsor and support programs such as this, very, very meaningful to us and allows us to best support our community. And we just want you to be aware of all of the choices and options that you have, be it in center, we heard a lot about transplant, which I found to be fascinating, and I can say that now I feel a whole lot more knowledgeable. Um, and then, you know, just knowing what your what your options are as you're um, as you're on that road to transplant potentially. And we um, are just pleased to share our knowledge um, more extensively with you. And I put some materials on the back table about satellite, so please feel free to check those um, those out as well. There's some um, little giveaways back there as well. And enjoy the rest of the program. And thank you very, very much for spending your Sunday with us. Thank you, Patrice. Our next speaker today has a lot of information to share. I want to welcome Dr. Graham Abra, as an abracadabra. <laughs> Dr. Abra is a nephrologist and a dialysis specialist. He's a clinical assistant professor of medicine, specifically nephrology, at Stanford University. He's a medical director at Wellbound San Jose. Dr. Abra is also the director of medical clinical affairs at Satellite Healthcare. He received his medical degree from the University of California, San Diego School of Medicine, and he did his residency in internal medicine there as well. Please welcome Dr. Abra. Thank you, Susan, much appreciated. So first of all, uh, th thank you guys. Thank you all for, for taking your time to, to come out and, uh, and uh, listen, listen to the presentations today. I, I really appreciate uh, your time and uh, uh, your enthusiasm. Some really great questions uh, for the first speaker. Um, I always feel, after going after a surgeon, I always feel a little uh, like I, I'm not quite as good. The surgeons always have great pictures. Um, so <laughs> ho hopefully, I, I'm ho hopeful I can give you uh, good information as well. So. Uh, I'm going to talk today a little bit about home dialysis, um, and uh, just to speak a little bit about my, my background, which will kind of give some context. Um, uh, so uh, as was mentioned, I, I work at Stanford. We've got about 30% of our patients on dialysis on home uh, dialysis modalities in our Stanford practice. Um, I also am the medical director down at Wellbound San Jose. Uh, the Wellbound centers, they're exclusively home dialysis centers. So all we do is peritoneal and home hemo at, at, at our uh, Wellbound center there in San Jose. And we've got about uh, 100 folks uh, who are on home dialysis out of our center. Uh, about 75 of them are on peritoneal dialysis and about 15 are on home hemodialysis. Uh, and uh, we support patients in home dialysis. We train them in home dialysis. Um, uh, and and that's, that's what uh, uh, our staff are expert in there. I also am the Director of Medical Clinical, Medical Clinical Affairs at Satellite Healthcare. So Satellite Healthcare is an organization with about 8,000 dialysis patients. Uh, we're spread across six different states. And 20% of our patients are on home dialysis, and that's the largest fraction of people on home dialysis of any of the dialysis providers. So it's a huge focus uh, 
focus uh, for the organization. And it's, it's, it's my passion. I love, I love home dialysis and I think it's a, it's an amazing, uh, it's an amazing thing to, uh, to offer. So, um, with that, I just, I just want to ask a very basic question and maybe someone from the audience could answer, um, you know, what kind of dialysis would a nephrologist do if they could not get a transplant from Dr. Nylinger and, and her group? Does anybody have a sense of, of what nephrologists say when they're asked this question? What's right for you? What's right for you? I think that's, that's a really good answer. That's a really good answer. And if you polled nephrologists, what, what modalities might they, uh, might they recommend? Well, home being on dialysis. And you know that's overwhelmingly the case. So this this type of a study has been done many many times, where large groups of nephrologists are surveyed and they're asked, "What kind of dialysis would you would you do while you're waiting for a transplant, or if you could not uh, receive a you know a preemptive living transplant?" And overwhelmingly, nephrologists. And if you look at this particular survey, uh, it was 93% of people said they would do some form of home dialysis, whether it be home hemodialysis. That's often the most common response, or peritoneal dialysis is usually a close second. Uh, it is in this particular survey. And then just a small fraction will say, I would go to in-center dialysis and do that three or more times a week. Um, uh, so overwhelmingly, nephrologists say, I would go home. So um, I want to uh, talk a little bit about today about why many nephrologists say that. So just a, just a you know, quick definitions about what dialysis is. It's, I noticed earlier we've got a really knowledgeable group, so some of this may be a little basic for you guys. But basically, you can do dialysis in two places. You can do it in your home, or you can do it in a dialysis center. And if you do dialysis at home, there are two sort of flavors of dialysis that you can do at home. Uh, the most common type is called peritoneal dialysis. Uh, with peritoneal dialysis, uh, it's a bloodless type of dialysis where we insert a small silicone tube into the abdomen, or rather our surgical colleagues do. And then uh, we take fluid, which has a high concentration of dextrose in it, and we uh, uh, flow it into the abdomen. And then that fluid pulls fluid and toxins uh, across the peritoneal membrane. And then uh, uh, after that fluid has sat there for a period of time, drain that, uh, drain that fluid out. So that's peritoneal dialysis. It's the most common type of home dialysis uh, at Satellite Healthcare. Um, uh, you know, 90% of our home patients are on a, a peritoneal type dialysis. Home hemodialysis is the other kind of dialysis that, that uh, you can do at home. Home hemodialysis is a blood-based kind of dialysis. Um, uh, uh, you use a fistula or a graft, uh, a vascular access uh, to take blood out of the body uh, to a machine uh, that cleans the blood, takes fluid out, and then returns it to you. So these are the, the basic flavors of, of uh, home dialysis uh, that, that you can do. And the flavors get a little more detailed. Um, there are different ways you can do peritoneal dialysis. There are different ways that you can do home hemodialysis. So uh, peritoneal dialysis... Um, <coughs> Uh, you, you may have heard these acronyms before. Um, uh, you can do peritoneal dialysis in a way that's called uh, continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis. This is, this is where you do manual exchanges uh, uh, of peritoneal dialysis fluid in and out of the belly. So there's no machine. It's just gravity, you, bags, tubing, sterile supplies. Um, typically with uh, continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis, typically four exchanges are done over uh, the course of the day. Um, and, you know, it can be done sort of in a variety of different patterns, but, but the basic idea is that it's a, it's a very manual process, no machines required. Very simple, very simple to learn how to do and perform. There's also uh, continuous cycler peritoneal dialysis, CCPD is the, is the jargon for it. Uh, with CCPD, we introduce a, a machine, so a cycler machine that can move fluid in and out of the belly. Uh, the, the main reason um, uh, this type of uh, uh, peritoneal dialysis is popular is because the cycler machine can be used overnight. So with uh, continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis, you've got to be awake to do your, your manual exchanges, so the exchanges are being done during the day. So they're burning time during the day to do these things. 
uh, with the cycler machine, uh, a, a typical pattern would be a, a patient would hook up to the machine at night, cycle, uh, have cycles overnight while they sleep, and then disconnect uh, in the morning, perhaps with a dwell of fluid in place that would stay throughout the day that they would then drain the following evening as they reconnected to the machine. So that the big advantage there is that it, it, it gives you the day mostly free. Uh, sometimes people will additionally do exchanges during the day depending on uh, uh, their medical needs. Uh, but those are the, the kind of the flavors of peritoneal uh, dialysis. And there, there's all kinds of mix and match that can be, be done with these, but those, those are the basics. Uh, home hemodialysis. Uh, home hemodialysis can be done uh, uh, during the day. Um, this is the, the most common way home hemodialysis is done. Um, uh, typically, people will do it five to six times a week. Um, the most common type of uh, home hemodialysis uh, machine is the next stage uh, system one, which is shown, shown there uh, in the picture. Um, uh, and, and typically, uh, uh, one does that five to six times a week. The sessions, uh, session length is somewhere on the order of two, two and a half, sometimes three hours, depending how large you are and what your needs are. Uh, uh, and uh, nice thing about home hemodialysis it, as compared to in center is that that two to three hours can come any time during your day that you want to do it. So it allows a lot of flexibility as compared to an in-center where you might say, you know, uh, my on time is at 6.30 a.m., uh, my off time is at 9.30 uh, uh, a.m., and uh, there's no, no wiggle room there. Uh, with, with home hemo, you can move that around uh, based, based on your schedule. Uh, home hemodialysis can also be done at night. Um, so some people do prolonged nocturnal hemodialysis. Uh, where they will do every other day or four times a week of longer nighttime dialysis sessions. Uh, this has the advantage of being done at night, uh, get leaving, the days, uh, leaving the days free, uh, uh, accessing the bloodstream uh, less, less frequently is an advantage to doing a prolonged nighttime uh, home hemodialysis. So uh, these are the, the general, general flavors of the types of uh, peritoneal dialysis and home hemodialysis uh, that you can do. So uh, with that as background of the types of home dialysis, I wanted to talk a little bit about the history because uh, I think it's helpful to understand how we got to where we are today uh, by, by looking at you know, what happened in the past to get us there. Um, so does anyone, does anyone know who uh, this, this guy is? Does anyone know uh, th that picture? Scribner. That's Scribner. So that's Belding Scribner. So he's largely regarded as one of the, the founding figures uh, uh, in, in dialysis. Uh, and he uh, uh, practiced up in uh, Seattle uh, at what has now become the Northwest Kidney Centers, which, which some of you uh, may have heard of. Uh, so in the early 1960s, uh, Dr. Scribner uh, was one of the uh, innovators in beginning to provide dialysis. And, and when dialysis was beginning in the 60s, it was really just provided for acute kidney failure. So it would be provided in the hospital very short term, um, and only if the patient recovered kidney function uh, uh, would they be able to continue living. People who needed long-term dialysis outside the hospital in the early 60s, uh, there wasn't a way to repeatedly access the bloodstream uh, to allow that to happen. Uh, every time they did dialysis in the hospital for acute kidney injury, they had to perform quite large surgical procedures to get access to the arteries and veins, and they would quickly run out of sights. Uh, so the big innovation uh, that Dr. Scribner came up with was, was this thing. Uh, does anyone know what this thing is, this, this picture? This, it seems like you know, you know your history. Uh, Scribner That's a Scribner shunt. Uh, so what Scribner did with um, uh, colleagues, uh, uh, actually I believe from Boeing, um, is they used Teflon uh, to develop a, a shunt that was connected to artery and vein, which re allowed repeated access to the bloodstream. And this allowed the first outpatient hemodialysis uh, program to begin because the bloodstream could now be repeatedly accessed without uh, uh, horrible damage to the, to the vasculature. So uh, uh, the picture down here is of a gentleman named uh, Clyde Shields. He was the first uh, outpatient hemodialysis uh, patient up in, the, up in the Seattle Center. Um, and he lived for 11 years on, on hemodialysis under uh, Dr. Scribner and colleagues' care um, uh, using, using a Scribner shunt for, uh, for uh, his dialysis. Um, big problem uh, with the uh, initial uh, start of dialysis in the, early, uh, the 60s and the early 70s was the resource was incredibly limited. So 
Um, the, the original Seattle center had three beds could accommodate somewhere between nine and 12 patients. And that's, that's it. That was their total census. That's who they could dialyze. And as a consequence, they had to, uh, decide who they were going to, uh, provide this care to. And, uh, they actually had a committee. This is a picture of the committee. Some of you may have seen there's a, there are some great documentaries that you can find on YouTube that detail the Seattle experience. Um, but they had a committee that was composed of not just medical personnel, but clergy, community members, uh, uh, teachers, uh, who evaluated each candidate uh, for uh, whether or not they were going to be accepted as a dialysis patient into the center. Uh, and you can imagine these were, you know, sort of gut-wrenching decisions that, that had to be made about whether dialysis care was going to be uh, offered to someone. Um, and as you can imagine, what relatively quickly happened was they had to reject people who, you know, otherwise, uh, you know, who uh, you know, were pretty, pretty darn good, but didn't quite meet their bar for uh, uh, who, the, who should go on to dialysis. And as a consequence, in 1963, home hemodialysis started as a way to uh, provide dialysis care uh, without all the expense of uh, the nursing personnel, uh, the facility, um, this is this is a picture of uh, the first home hemodialysis patient, uh, a 15-year-old girl uh, and her mother, uh, who uh, were rejected by the committee for uh, uh, being accepted to the in-center. And they, uh, with Dr. Scribner and colleagues' help, uh, uh, set up home dialysis. And this this rapidly grew uh, as an option for people because uh, the the in-center resource was was so limited. Now, this changes in 1973. Uh, when uh, Medicare begins providing uh, a, a reimbursement for end-stage renal disease care. So Medicare started in 1965. In 1973, it was amended such that anybody with end-stage renal disease who uh, you know, qualified for Social Security uh, could receive a, a, a dialysis care. And this led to a real rapid change in uh, the fractions of patients that were on home dialysis versus in-center because the in-center facilities then started to proliferate because now there was reimbursement for providing dialysis care and it was much easier to do in-center. You didn't have to train, you didn't have to support. Um, and so the in-center facilities uh, really proliferated after 1973 and home hemodialysis became uh, more unusual than it was uh, at the start. Peritoneal dialysis also began in the 60s, uh, but really didn't take off until the early 1980s uh, when certain technological innovations that are kind of shown here um, uh, uh, became available that made it a much more user-friendly therapy. So in the, in the early 1980s, um, the first bagged uh, dialysate for peritoneal dialysis became available. Prior to this, uh, they were using sterilized uh, solutions in glass jars. It was very clunky and cumbersome. Um, uh, the uh, peritoneal dialysis catheters uh, became uh, much better for longer term use in the early 1980s. Prior to this, uh, they were often doing repeated punctures of the abdomen to do PD. Um, so the catheters became ones that could be uh, long term indwelling. Um, and the first cycler machines uh, became available in the early 1980s, which allowed the, the overnight uh, cycler peritoneal dialysis uh, uh, therapy to uh, start to become available. Uh, so uh, with these innovations, peritoneal dialysis started to become more, more popular in the 1980s. And here's, here's just a picture of kind of what happened uh, uh, with the fraction of p patients on those different modalities over time. And it kind of show, shows in a picture what we were just talking about in a story. So the blue, uh, you know, the time here is on the, uh, the bottom, the horizontal axis. So it goes all the way from 1969 all the way up to 2008 here. Uh, the blue bars... Uh, are the fractions of patients who are on home hemo. Uh, the green bars are the fractions of patients on PD. And what you can see here, you know, 1973 is around there. You can see at, at, at its height, home hemodialysis, you're talking almost, you know, it was almost 40% of patients uh, were on home hemo. And then when the Medicare reimbursement came in, that, that fraction dramatically dropped off as the in-centers really proliferated. And then, as I was mentioning, when the te technical innovations came in for PD, PD really took off. 
uh, and became a fairly, uh, fairly common modality. At, at its height, about 15% of uh, patients were using uh, peritoneal dialysis. And that's a far cry from today. Um, you know, where, uh, you know, around 10, 12% of, of all patients are on some kind of home modality. Um, and then PD started to wane after the, after the uh, sort of mid to early 90s um, for, for a variety of reasons. Um, what has happened since 2008 is actually home, hem uh, home dialysis is making a comeback. So here's, this is kind of extending the graph. Here's, here's 2008 all the way up to 2013. Um, and this, this line here is the number of patients on home hemo. So you can see, see it's still relatively unusual, but the, you see the, the line is going up. And PD, uh, the line is, is going up since 2008. Um, what happened in 2008 was uh, uh, another amendment to Medicare was put in place uh, that um, uh, defined the bundling of a payment for dialysis care. Um, it, the, uh, the bundling of payment actually went into effect in 2011, but uh, many, many in the uh, nephrology community started shifting practice uh, because of the change in the payment mechanism, and uh, home dialysis has become much, much more popular again. So uh, that's kind of how we get to today. Um, home dialysis is, is resilient and rising, uh, not, not back to the levels where it was at the beginning of dialysis, but it's becoming a much more popular way uh, for, for people to do uh, dialysis therapy. Now, uh, so why, why, would, why would anyone ever want to do home dialysis? Um, and when I, when I talk to people about this, when I talk to patients about it, um, I think really the strongest reasons are, are practical in nature. Um, as to why one might want to do home dialysis. There are a lot of, there are clinical reasons as well, but I think these practical ones are the ones that really are most impactful. Um, as we were kind of talking about earlier, flexibility of schedule is, is huge. You know, you're not beholden to the center's time slots and days. You know, it's not Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. You've got flexible schedule for work, for travel, you know, all, all the things that we all have to do in our lives uh, when you're doing home dialysis, and you can uh, flex, flex around those things. Um, it also gives you complete control over your treatment. So um, Dr. Nylinger was kind of mentioning, um, you know, people who are the most active and engaged, actually, Susan, you mentioned the people who are most active and engaged in, in their care are generally the people who do best. Uh, no one takes care of you like you. Um, even the most caring nurse or physician is still not going to be as good as you are. Um, and taking control over that treatment uh, is, is a huge, a huge thing. Uh, there are less dietary restrictions on peritoneal dialysis and home hemodialysis. That's a big draw for them. Within center, there's a lot of restrictions to fluid, to phosphorus, to sodium, to potassium. They are much less so uh, with peritoneal dialysis and home hemodialysis. Um, and they reduce commute times and visits to the dialysis center, which, you know, if you're doing three or four times a week in center, that's not an insignificant amount of time that you start talking about driving back and forth between the center uh, uh, as, as, a, as, as something that you need to visit. So for these practical reasons, people are, often start thinking about home, home dialysis um, because it, it has these benefits. Uh, uh, people often then ask, well, Okay, so this sounds pretty good, but how long is it going to take me to learn how to do this? I mean, you know, nurses go to school for years, doctors for years. How, how, how long is it going to take me to learn how to do home dialysis? Um, in general, uh, peritoneal dialysis takes about two weeks of training uh, to learn how to do. Generally, we train people how to do uh, continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis first. So you learn how to do those manual exchanges. That's a, that's a really great backup to have in the event that a machine stops working or the power goes out. Um, so peritoneal dialysis, it takes about, about two weeks of training to, to learn the basic theories, um, to learn um, you know, uh, proper uh, infection control and hygiene techniques, uh, and to learn uh, how to perform the exchanges appropriately. Home hemodialysis takes longer, takes about six weeks. Uh, uh, some in the room have experience with it. Um, everybody's a little bit different in the training time. Um, you have to learn how to uh, uh, manage the dialysis machine. Uh, what often takes the longest, though, is learning how to uh, place the needles into your own fistula or graft. Some people also do home hemodialysis with a catheter, which generally takes less time to learn how to use, but the preferred access is generally a fistula or a graft because they're uh, usually lower risk for infection. 
perfection. So the, the longest part of the home hemo training usually is, is getting really good and comfortable uh, with uh, getting the needles into, into the access. Um, uh, after training, it's not like you're sort of dropped off and that's the end of things. Um, you know, the, your home training nurse is, uh, you know, becomes an integral part of your care team. You know, someone who you're going to be in touch with frequently throughout uh, throughout the month. You'll generally see them at least once a, once a month, if not more often, for blood draws. Uh, you know, for checking on medications, for getting supplies, um, and they're also available 24/7 uh, on call, at least at our center at Wellbound San Jose, which is you know critical if you're doing dialysis at home because questions questions pop up. So uh, this, is, this is another really common question that people ask. How much time does dialysis take each week? If you kind of look at the different dialysis modalities. Um, and you kind of have to take into account several things when you think about how much time you're committing to each of these things. So in center dialysis, in, in general, you know, if you, just the dialysis time itself, you know, somewhere 10, 12 hours a week, something like that. Uh, but then there's travel time that goes on top of that. Uh, you know, to from the center. And then what people often don't take into account is the recovery time, because it's not uncommon for people who do in-center dialysis three times a week to say, you know, it takes me somewhere on the order of four to eight hours before I'd feel normal again after the dialysis session. So there's this large chunk of recovery time after uh, in-center dialysis that people often don't take into account when they're thinking about how much time during their week is going to be taken up with dialysis-related stuff. Um, home hemo, you know, you're doing more time on dialysis. You're doing it five, six times a week. Uh, there is sometimes a little bit of recovery time. Um, many patients, though, report that they don't have much in the way of recovery time at all after their dialysis sessions. You do have to manage supplies, so that's something that's very different from in-center dialysis. You've got supply management that uh, takes up time during the week, and you do um, still have to go to your uh, dialysis clinic. Not every week, but typically at least month a once a month for things like blood draws, picking up supplies, uh, physician visits, that kind of stuff. Uh, CAPD takes up less time in terms of the dialysis itself, some supply management, some clinic visits. Uh, nighttime cycler, CCPD, is probably the least uh, in terms of the time commitment because much of the dialysis is occurring during the night. So the time you're spending setting up and tearing down the machine uh, is, is really the bulk of you know, the time, time that comes up here. So these different time commits, it's, I think it's helpful because that you know we're talking about almost a full time job within center versus you know a part time job when you talk about you know a, a cycler kind of kind of therapy. Um, uh, people, the, another common thing that comes up, it, you know, people say home dialysis isn't that for like you know twenty five year old Google engineers who just have kidney failure and no other problem. It's really not. It's it's for all, a whole wide range of people. So this is looking at satellite healthcare data. Um, you know, uh, when we look at PD, it's over a third of our patients are sixty five or older. Thirteen percent have minimal or no English uh, language skills. 20% uh, are sing single, unmarried, 10% live alone, don't have a care partner. Um, so a whole variety of people uh, do peritoneal dialysis. And home hemodialysis, similar. 26% um, over 65 years old. Uh, most of our home hemo patients do speak English, but there are some who do not. 21% um, uh, are single and 6% live alone. So we even have home hemodialysis patients who dialyze solo. They don't have a care partner. Um, that's, that's another question that comes up a lot. Do I have to have someone who will take care of me? It's always best if you do, uh, but we have people who dialyze alone, uh, both with uh, uh, PD and with uh, home hemodialysis. Um, so there are some challenges with PD that, that people will bring up. They'll say, oh, I've got this thing or that thing. I, I don't think I could do peritoneal dialysis. But there, there are solutions to a lot of the challenges. So we've had patients who can only use one arm. Uh, and they can do peritoneal dialysis. They're actually adaptive. Uh, 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 there's adaptive equipment that allows you to do the exchanges with just one hand. Um, the people who will say, ah, my vision isn't, isn't really that good. We now have uh, cycler machines that actually have audio instructions. And we also have uh, studies that look at patients who are blind who actually can successfully perform uh, peritoneal dialysis with the light, right training and support. Um, hearing impairment, so um, uh, we've actually adapted some of the cycler machines, which typically beep, uh, to use uh, uh, vibration uh, for patients who uh, have hearing impairment. Um, if you're older, 
doesn't mean you can't do a peritoneal dialysis. We have many patients uh, who are in their 80s or 90s um, who successfully do a PD at home. One thing that does come up uh, as you're older or if uh, uh, you're younger and have many medical issues, the supply management can be a challenge uh, because the peritoneal dialysis solution is quite heavy. Um, uh, uh, the uh, so moving the boxes can be a challenge if you don't have someone to help you. Um, uh, so that, that is something that is really important to keep in mind with PD. Um, some people say, I, I'm, I'm too big. There's no way I would be able to do PD. I, I don't know where they'd put the catheter. You know, I, I don't know if we could do it. Uh, the PD catheters, although they're typically placed in the abdomen, they can also be pre placed pre-sternally so that the surgeons can tunnel the catheter up. Uh, it, it comes out of the abdomen. They tunnel it up under the skin, and it comes out actually right over your breastbone. Um, and uh, PD can be done in this way for people who carry a, a lot of extra weight. Um, uh, some people will say, ah, I've got hernias, you know, there's no way I'd, I'd be able to do PD. Uh, hernias can be repaired and you can successfully do PD uh, after. Um, uh, so uh, all these challenges, these are things that can be overcome. There, uh, many different types of people can do PD. People always ask about travel uh, with both PD and home hemo. Uh, uh, understandably, we all love to travel. Well, probably not all of us, but mo I think the majority of us love, love to travel in some way, shape, or form. Um, critical for everyone to know, there's something called the Air Carrier Access uh, Act. Um, this particular section uh, defines that airlines aren't allowed to charge for dialysis machines when they are taken onto the airplane. So uh, they can be checked into the luggage or actually can be brought as carry-on. Um, the, uh, the cycler, some of the cycler machines will fit into the overhead bins. The, the next stage machine um, is a little bit larger. It's 75 pounds. It does have to be checked. Um, but, uh, but airlines can't charge you for it. Uh, you can get the PD cyclers uh, uh, to fit into the overhead bin. And uh, uh, what we generally do is we ship dialysate to the location where you're going uh, with either PD or home hemo. Uh, uh, so that you can do dialysis at the location that uh, you, you know, you're going to. So uh, PD and home hemo are really nice ways uh, to be able to travel. They come with you know, some logistical challenges, um, but it is a very nice benefit of the, the modalities that it makes travel a little bit, uh, a little, a little bit easier than uh, in-center does in some ways. Um, people ask about exercise and PD. It's absolutely encouraged. Just because we're using the belly uh, doesn't mean we don't want you exercise. Um, uh, I, I do generally recommend for patients if they're doing heavy weightlifting or contact, uh, you know, more, more intense types of sports that they don't have a dwell in place while they're doing the sport because uh, the intra-abdominal uh, pressure does increase when you're, you know, say, lifting weights. Um, and so not having the dwell in place there uh, reduces the risk that you might get a leak around the catheter site. But we love it when, our, uh, w uh, when folks are, you know, active and exercising. Um, some people say, ah, I'm not going to be able to swim because I got this PD catheter uh, that's in my belly. We actually have a program that allows our patients to swim in ocean, chlorinated pools, river, lake swimming. They're okay with special precautions. Um, so we supply patients with ostomy bags um, and uh, uh, supplies so that they can cover their PD catheter successfully so they can uh, swim in all of these types of uh, locations. I generally don't recommend that people go in hot tubs and jacuzzis because the, uh, the adhesive uh, melts off and the, the ostomy bag will, will often come off. But you can swim uh, with PD, which is uh, you know, some, uh, some, something uh, that people often uh, bring up as, as a potential drawback to PD. Um, survival, okay, so this is a hot topic, um, uh, at, least among, uh, at least among doctors. Uh, argue about this a lot, whether there's any difference in survival between patients who are on peritoneal dialysis and home and hemodialysis, in center hemodialysis. Back in the early 2000s, there did seem to be some survival difference. In more recent years, the, the lines are pretty close in terms of uh, the length of time that a person survives on these types of dialysis. In fact, PD, some studies suggest, uh, has a survival advantage in the first year or two, perhaps related to protection of remaining kidney function, which is a, an advantage of PD versus in center. Um, but in general, the survival curves are about the same. So it kind of comes back to those practical issues. You know, what, uh, uh, you know uh, do you want flexibility? Do you want to take charge of your therapy? Uh, is, uh, you know, is diet important? Of course, it's important to us all. You know, can, can I eat what I, what I want to eat? Um, uh, 
some additional PD advantages I just mentioned. Um, it does preserve the remaining kidney function better than hemodialysis does. Uh, it also preserves uh, your vasculature should you need to transition to hemodialysis in the future. So you've got multiple sites to do dialysis. One is your peritoneum. Um, so uh, 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 it's a great one to use uh, so that you've got vascular access uh, should you need it uh, later on. Also with home hemo, this, this applies to both PD and home hemo, Medi Medicare starts day one of, of PD and home hemo training as opposed to hemodialysis where it doesn't start till the third month. Um, so this can be a, you know, a, a big difference for a lot of people because you don't accrue the costs of dialysis for that initial, initial three months. So this is, this is a, a nice advantage to PD uh, and home hemo. Uh, some downsides, so nothing is perfect. Um, PD does have its downsides, its issues. The one that uh, I think there's a lot of myth and misconception around is peritonitis and exit site infections. So it used to be that these were massive problems in PD. Um, uh, infection rates were quite high and a big issue. Um, now, uh, at least at, at our center and at many others, the peritonitis rate is one in a, about every four or five years on average. So the peritonitis rates have come way, way down with modern techniques, modern training. Uh, the infection rates with peritonitis are much, much lower uh, than they were in the past. Ditto for exit site infection rates. Uh, much, much lower with uh, modern prophylactic uh, techniques for, for exit sites. So these are real. People do get peritonitis. They do get exit site infections, but the rates are much lower than they were in the past. And in general, they can be treated with outpatient antibiotics. Um, one of the big things that can go wrong with hemodialysis, particularly in center, particularly if you're dialyzing with a catheter, is a bloodstream infection can lead to really severe complications, endocarditis, osteomyelitis, infection in the bone. Um, in general, peritonitis and exit site infections are, are more mild uh, and can be treated outpatient as opposed to bloodstream infections, which typically require hospitalization. Um, drain pain and catheter issues are real issues. So, Draining fluid out of the belly um, can be uncomfortable. It can cause a pinching type sensation. Um, uh, uh, there are things that we can do to minimize this if it does occur for you. Um, catheter issues. So some people may have had the experience of having a PD catheter placed and having a lot of trouble with either uh, fluid going in or fluid going out. Um, there are things that can be done to address this. The, the cornerstone of uh, taking care of catheter issues is making sure there's no constipation. Uh, when there's no constipation, in general, the catheter issues are pretty low. Um, cycler issues and supplies, so the cyclers aren't perfect. They do beep, they do alarm, they do sometimes have errors. Um, that's why we have 24-7 on-call nurses to deal with issues that come up. Um, supplies, we were talking about. Supply storage is a big issue with both PD and home hemo. You do have to store supplies in your home, so you need space for this. Um, so it's important to, to evaluate this um, uh, uh, as, as part of thinking about whether home dialysis is right for you. Uh, PD, weight gain from dextrose and dialysate, so it's sugar. Uh, that we're putting into the belly. So uh, people do tend to gain some weight on peritoneal dialysis because of the sugar loads. And this can be more of a problem for people with, uh, with diabetes. Um, so this is, a, this is an important uh, issue to know about. Um, it generally doesn't prevent someone from doing PD, but it's an important uh, uh, risk to know about. Uh, you can get hernias while on peritoneal dialysis. They're generally easily repaired. They don't require you to stop PD while they're repaired necessarily. Uh, uh, but these are some things that sometimes occur. Uh, the peritoneal membrane, it doesn't last forever, just like a fistula or a graft, it doesn't last forever. Um, and so eventually, usually the PD membrane will fail, but this, this happens uh, you know, quite late, usually after a decade or so of, of PD use. Uh, sometimes earlier, uh, particularly if there's repeated episodes of peritonitis, but uh, uh, in general, that membrane can be used for quite a long time, your peritoneal membrane. This is a very rare complication that uh, occur, occurs late in peritoneal dialysis. It's something called uh, encapsulating, uh, encapsulating peritoneal sclerosis. It's a very severe complication. Typically, it doesn't happen until after eight to 10 years of PD. Um, it's very severe when it happens. It, it, it's basically an a, a encapsulation of the bowel. It causes very severe problems. It has um, very high mortality rates, but it's rare, and it happens uh, late in PD. So PD is not perfect. It has its downsides, but it has a lot of upsides as well. Uh, home hemo, um, just briefly to touch on some of the benefits that have been shown in various studies. Um, we talked about liberalization of diet. 
It also likely reduces post-dialysis uh, recovery time. You kind of saw the recovery times that we were talking about, uh, you know, in center somewhere on four to eight hour kind of range uh, with uh, home hemo generally on the uh, half an hour to an hour or less uh, recovery time. There have been studies looking at sleep. People often sleep better um, when they're doing uh, frequent daily home hemodialysis. Uh, physical and emotional well-being, when uh, people do studies on surveys of uh, how people feel, how functional they are, um, uh, people on uh, home hemodialysis generally do better than people on in center. Um, depressive symptom burden is generally less in people on home hemo versus uh, in center dialysis. Um, uh, people on uh, home hemo also have to use fewer blood pressure drugs and fewer phosphorus binder drugs, both of which can be expensive and burdensome to, uh, to use. Big question though is, is home hemo safe? If you're thinking about, gosh, I'm gonna do this big complicated thing, hemodialysis at home. Um, as we mentioned before, that's why we have 24 seven on-call uh, dialysis nurses. Uh, but when we look at studies of how risky it is to do home hemodialysis, the risk of severe complications that might send you to the hospital, something like you know, a needle dislodgement where you'd have a bunch of blood loss, it's on the order of one in every 26,000 dialysis treatments. So it is a very safe therapy if you've gone through an appropriate uh, training time and have been well trained on how to do uh, home hemodialysis. Um, uh, so uh, it, it's definitely a scary thing to confront, but studies of, of people who have gone successfully tr uh, through training show that the severe events that happen at home are relatively uncommon. Home hemodialysis versus hemodialysis, survival may actually be better. Um, uh, you know, PD, it's a little more equivocal. Um, home hemodialysis, some studies suggest that survival rates may even be better. People may live longer when you do frequent home hemodialysis. This is always an argument uh, uh, when uh, scientists get together because it is very, very challenging, almost impossible to do the randomized control trial where, where someone would be either assigned to in center or home hemodialysis because people uh, you know, generally refuse that. If they want to do home hemo, they're going to do it. They're not going to agree to be randomized to one or the other. So we instead rely on uh, retro looking backwards at groups of patients who have been on in center and have been on uh, 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 home hemodialysis and then try to st statistically match them. Um, and in general, it looks like survival is probably better on home hemodialysis, which is part of the reason that many nephrologists will say, Home hemodialysis is probably what I would do. Um, this is a nice sort of summary of, uh, you know, kind of the different um, uh, 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 factors that go into selecting a dialysis modality. If, if you guys haven't uh, seen this website, www.homedialysis.org, um, it's a home dialysis central. It's a really great resource. Um, has all sorts of great information. This is this is um, just one of the items that's on there. Um, but basically goes through sort of a, a step by step of you know things that you're going to care about. Um, you know, uh, diet and fluids. Uh, dialysis making you feel better. Uh, is it work friendly? Um, are you going to be in charge of it, etc. Um, and kind of looks at the different modalities. Uh, CAPDE you know, cycler dialysis, conventional home hemo, daily home hemo, nocturnal home hemo, in-center hemodialysis, and kind of allows you to think about uh, these different things and the risks and the benefits of them. Um, so this is a really nice resource that's out there um, uh, to kind of think through the, the dialysis decision if that's, if that's one you're facing. And I think we're getting to the end of my slides here. All right, so, the, the, uh, you know, I just want to leave you guys with... Um, you know, this th when I'm in clinic and someone is nearing the need for dialysis, I, I think everybody is naturally very, you know, you're scared. This is a really uh, a hard thing to confront um, because every, your life is changing. Um, and people will often say, you know, is there going to be any life after my kidneys stop working? You know, what, what's, what's going to happen? Um, you know, and I, I try to tell, tell people, that, yeah, absolutely there's life, but, but it's going to be different. Um, you're going to have to decide about, uh, uh, you know, what you're going to do next. And there are a whole uh, variety of options um, that are out there. And, uh, you know, all the ones that we talked about here, um, uh, the ones that were talked about earlier with transplant, um, there are all these options that are out there. And if one of them isn't working for you, there's nothing that says you can't change to another one. Uh, so it, it's important to know that all these things are out there and you can tailor them to, to your particular situation. So just to give an example in close to, before I close, um, 
I, I had a patient who uh, initially he started on um, uh, peritoneal dialysis uh, uh, to allow him to work. He was on uh, CCPD, cycler peritoneal dialysis. Um, he had diabetes and unfortunately he gained a huge amount of weight uh, while he was on PD um, related to the dextrose that he was getting um, as well as not being able to exercise uh, and eat the way that he wanted to because of his work schedule. Um, so uh, he decided he wanted to get bariatric surgery. So we said, okay, um, uh, we want to make that happen for you. So we said, okay, we're going to stop the CCPD. We're going to switch you to home hemodialysis. He said, that's perfect. You know, it allowed me to keep working. I already love taking care of myself at home. I like the flexibility. So we switched him over to daily uh, home hemodialysis. He was able to get his bariatric surgery, lost the weight. Um, unfortunately, at that point, his mother got really sick. Um, and he had to start taking care of her uh, during the days. Um, and uh, was very tired afterwards. Uh, so we switched from daily home hemodialysis, we switched him over to nocturnal dialysis in the center. And that allowed him to take care of his mom during the day and get great dialysis at night and give him enough energy such that he could uh, uh, continue uh, to take care of his mom. Then it switched again, his mom, um, uh, he, there was a caregiver situation where uh, he now needed to take care of her at night uh, because she was waking up uh, frequently and, and, and walking around. And so the nighttime dialysis wasn't, wasn't going to work for him anymore. So he actually switched over um, uh, to in-center frequent dialysis. So he was dial dialyzing four times a week in-center uh, during the day. Uh, he was able to get a day caregiver, and then he was able to be awake at night to, to help his mom when she uh, was waking up. Um, at, during this time, he was able to get listed and uh, now has a deceased donor transplant. So all these things, they're all options. You can walk through them depending on what, uh, you know, is going on in life and what your goals are. Um, and I just, just want to make sure that you guys know that those options are, are there because they're, they're uh, ones that uh, can, can really help you. Uh, so uh, thank you for your time. That's, uh, that's, that's all I got for slides. Thank you, Dr. Abra. We have some questions, I'm sure, from the audience, so please raise your hand if you happen to have any questions. Is it possible to do influence 